Good evening, everybody. My name is Jody DeBrine, and I am the Director of Collections at the Mark Twain House Museum. It is my very best pleasure to welcome you here this evening for tonight's uh, talk. Um, we have Alexandra Lang and Dan Har for a discussion on Alexandra's book, Meet Me by the Fountain. Um, I'll introduce our guests more uh, formally in just a moment. But first, I want to thank our sponsors for this event. Uh, the Mark Twain House and Museum's virtual programs are produced in part um, with support honoring Frank Lord, a beloved trustee of the museum who passed away a few years ago. We're happy to honor his memory with these programs, which he would have loved so much. We are also incredibly grateful to the Wish You Well Foundation and CT Public WNPR for supporting tonight's program and all of our other virtual programs. Um, first, I'd like to uh, kind of point you guys to the side of your screen. There is a chat there. Um, we encourage you guys to talk amongst yourselves while this is all, while the Alexandra and Dan are talking about the wonderful book. Um, if you have a question for Alexandra, there is a Q&A feature down at the bottom of your screen. Um, click it in there and we'll be sure not to miss it with everything else going on in the chat. Um, I'll also point out that you can purchase a uh, copy of Meet Me at the Fountain. Um, it's a fantastic book. I just finished it today and um, it's nonfiction, but it reads like fiction. There's great photos. It's really enjoyable. It's really funny. Um, you pick it up through uh, the Mark Twain House store. Um, not only are you supporting the museum and our programs and our bookshop, um, but it's also signed. So, you know, you can't get that just at your other everyday bookstore. Um, so definitely pick that up. There'll be a link in the chat for you to be able to purchase that tonight. Um, so now on to our guests. Um, Alexandra Lang uh, is a design critic whose essays, reviews, and profiles have appeared in numerous design publications, including Architect, Harvard Design Magazine and T Magazine, as well as The Atlantic, New York Magazine, The New Yorker, and The New York Times. Um, in 2000 and, uh, sorry, 2021, uh, Alexander became an editorial advisor to the podcast New Angle Voice, produced by the Beverly Willis Architecture Foundation. Um, that podcast showcases uh, the work of pioneering women in American architecture. And her previous book, The Design of Childhood, a Mature World Shapes Independent Kids was published in 2018. Um, and then our moderator for this evening is Dan Haar. Um, he is a col columnist and associate editor at the Hearst Connecticut Media, writing about the intersection of business, public policy, and politics, and how issues affect people in Connecticut. So I would like to welcome both of them back onto screen um, to join us. And uh, there you are. Hi, you two. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. And it'll be such a great uh, discussion, I know, from what we've already talked about behind the scenes. Um, so before I, uh, I guess, pop off, Alexandra, do you want to tell us, for the people who haven't read your book, just a little bit of overview, and then you guys can get going with your discussion? Sure. Um, Basically, my book is about the history and future of the shopping mall. So it starts in 1950 with Victor Gruen, who I'm sure we're going to be talking about in a second, and goes all the way to the present day and kind of what the pandemic has wrought on shopping malls. And along the way, we talk about some of the kind of great innovators in shopping mall history. We talk about when malls go back to the city. We talk about malls and movies. We talk about zombie movies like it really has a little bit of everything that I could put in there that to tell what I think is a very fascinating story um, of how shopping malls have shaped both cities and shaped culture over the last 70 plus years. Fantastic. That's a great introduction. Uh, when you first I want to say uh, thank you to the Mark Twain House and to Jody uh, for that introduction. I'm honored to be a part of anything related to the name of Frank Lord. Uh, I was uh, uh, lucky enough to have known him and I know Suzanne and, and all they do in Hartford. Um, so uh, Alexandra, you didn't start out writing this book or reporting this book, researching this book as an expert on malls. You've done uh, a lot of work in architecture and design. Um, and yet everybody has a, uh, a mall story, a mall history. What is yours? So I grew up in Durham, North Carolina. 
And I started going to the mall with my mom when I was, you know, eight or nine years old. And in the introduction to the book, I sort of talk about the three malls that really shaped my life growing up in Durham. There was Northgate, which was sort of the regular mall that had a Sears and a Radio Shack. Um, there was South Square, which was slightly more upscale, and that had the Gap. I was very, very into the Gap in the 80s. And then there was Crabtree Valley Mall in Raleigh, which was the special mall and was the only place you could get Esprit clothing, and it had a workbench um, and a fancier department store. So that was sort of my once a year mall. Um, when I started researching this book, I went and looked at what had happened to my three malls, and each of them basically intersected with the history of malls. South Square was demolished, um, so sort of right after the recession in the like late 2000s. Northgate limped along for a while and is now being leveled and is going to be turned into like mixed use housing and medical facilities. And Crabtree Valley, which was the nicest mall, is still one of the nicest malls in the area. And it is really like held on to its market position. Mm -hmm. And so the, so there right there in your three malls was the, the, the entire past, present and future of malls. And we're going to get into that and the myth of the extinction of malls that, that's been written many times. And we may be in another of those periods that may or may not be right. Um, but was there in, in the old Borscht Belt joke, was there was there the mall where you wouldn't set foot? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, no. Uh, not really. I mean, I think that there are some people that in recent years might not have wanted to go to Northgate because it's definitely had some problems. But when I was growing up, this is like 80s, early 90s. It was fine, like it wasn't fancy, but it was fine. Um, like I, as I say in the intro, like I had a little girl that I babysat every weekend and we would go there to ride the carousel and buy French fries at McDonald's. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, that's great. Yeah. Um, and, and so as we get into talking about the meaning of malls and I should say at the outset here that what's great about this book and I agree with Jody, it's a great book. And I, I have done uh, a, a number of these talks and this is, uh, th this is a book that captures the imagination more easily than many of the books we've talked about here because it is something that we all relate to. We've all been to the mall. We all have mall stories. I got in trouble at the mall, you know, all that stuff. Um, that was as an adult, not as a kid. Um, it, and so <laughs> I let my kid go a little too far without, a, I was watching her, but they didn't think I was watching her. But in any case, we all have mall stories. And so it, it, part of what, what makes this subject great and the book great is that it, 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 it's a story really about everything American, about American culture. And it is, it, is, it is law, which we'll get into. It is the merchandising. It is sociology, the behavior around malls. It is, of course, architecture and design. Is there something about malls that surprised you in doing this that you, that, that, that you, you didn't realize, uh, perhaps some of the great architects who have worked on malls or, or perhaps the, the way malls have differentiated themselves? Yeah, I mean, finding out how many very famous Pritzker Prize reigning architects had designed malls was really interesting to me because I think people tend to think when they hear the word mall of this kind of lowest common denominator mall, which is like your gray boxes by the highway in the middle of a parking lot. But Frank Gehry designed a mall um, called Santa Monica Place in the early 1970s. I am Pei designed a shopping center, like the immediate precursor to the mall, um, Roosevelt Field on Long Island in the late 50s. Um, Eero Saarinen himself did not design a mall, but his partner soon after his death designed the Neiman Marcus at North Park Mall in Dallas, which the body of the mall was designed by somebody who had worked for Minoru Yamasaki, the architect of the Twin Towers. So in, like, in their heyday, like in their early years, malls were really considered um, like quite a plum project and architects really put their all into them. And it's only as they became more widespread and de you know, developers of malls realized that maybe they didn't have to spend quite so much money on the architecture and people would still shop that they became so bland, especially on the outside. So let's talk about that a little bit. I see, a, a, in, and in reading the book, there's, there, there's a, one of the, the several themes in the book is there is that difference between the mall as sameness, and you don't use that phrase or that description, but but to, even not that not that long after the original development of malls, malls sort of become this sort of 
American strip, Americana, the same thing. It's predictable, which is good. It's comfort, which is good. It's efficient, which is good. It, it serves the new car uh, culture, which is good. But you know, it's the mall. It's not quite as exciting as it could be maybe. And then there are the malls that you've just described and some that you're going to describe that are the malls of the, that, that are now being developed going forward. Which is the lasting impression of malls? Or is there this sort of constant strain between the mall as sameness and the mall as something special? Well, you asked me about this yesterday, and I realized that I think, you know, the mall is, you know, the mall is like shopping. The mall is a shoppable product. And so the, the phrase that came to my mind was one from um, Raymond Lowy, who was an early modernist architect and designer. And he always spoke about like introducing a new product to the marketplace as his, his acronym was Maya, most advanced yet acceptable. So it was like, people don't wanna be surprised, but they want to be like pushed just slightly forward. So I think the mall is always first, the first wave of a new innovation, like people are excited about it and then they get used to it. And then, then it becomes time for a new innovator to kind of change it up. So I think a lot of times when people are finding malls ho-hum, that's really in the like few years before something really changed at the mall. And it's kind of the same life cycle as a fashion design or a product um, that you would buy in a store, like an appliance that like it has to become a little bit boring for them to be this burst of new creativity and a leap forward. Right, right. And I should mention for people that are here in Connecticut, from Connecticut, Errol Saarinen, whom you mentioned, was uh, he later, I don't know if when he designed that, he was in Connecticut, he may have been in Michigan, but he later moved to Hamden, Connecticut, and was arguably the progenitor of, of some of the great architecture uh, giants in Connecticut, uh, uh, Cesar Pelli, who worked with him, I believe, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. So there's yes, some, right. <laughs> there's a, a great, great connection there, Kevin Roche. Um, so we're going to come back to the great architects, but let's talk about the beginning of the mall. You mentioned Victor Gruen. Um, who was Victor Gruen and what did he do and how did he do it? Uh, and I want to, I'll, I'll ask a follow-up question about the accident. Okay, so Victor Gruen was um, a Viennese emigre. He was Jewish, so he emigrated from Vienna to New York City in 1938. And he had already started to design very like modern, intricate shops when he was in Vienna. And when he moved to New York, his first job was actually building a model for the Futurama, the General Motors Pavilion at the World's Fair. And what was in the Futurama? it was a model of what the US would look like in the year 1960. So I just love imagining this like recent emigre kind of getting dropped down into New York City and already being tasked with building a model of the future of the United States. And I feel like this was a really formative experience for Gruen. He did that, then he went back and started his own practice designing some very, very stylish boutiques. Um, the owner of a sort of middle range line of department stores called Grayson's like loved his work, hired him and his first wife, Elsie Crummick to design these department stores. So Gruen like very swiftly kind of rose through the ranks of architecture in the 1940s. And then in the early 1950s, he began to realize that the department stores uh, were starting to face kind of a headwind and that there were all these new suburbs that were gonna start to siphon off the business from the downtown department stores. And he felt that what the department stores needed if they were gonna to move to the suburbs was a setting, like a miniature main street. And that was what the mall was supposed to provide. And the first, uh, the first mall that he designed that was an enclosed interior mall was Southdale in Edina, Minnesota, which essentially has a town square in the middle that's lit by skylights from above. Um, it had a carousel, it had an aviary, it even had like a little Viennese cafe that was all inside. Um, an, avi so an aviary? An aviary, yes. There were, are actually a lot of like animal displays in the early malls. There's a famous mall in New Jersey that had monkeys. Um, there are a lot of like bird cages. It was part of this idea that the mall was like a little bit like a park or a zoo or like a carnival atmosphere, but it was all inside. 
So this isn't like Home Depot where you get the birds in the rafters. These are, this is an no, order. These, these are decorative birds. <laughs> decorative birds. Okay. Yeah. So, so what happened in Detroit and how did Victor Gruen get, that's a great segment in your book, how Victor Gruen ends up in Detroit and what he did there. I love that. Yeah. So luckily for us, Victor Gruen's memoirs were translated a few years ago. So I was able to read them. And I mean, they have to be taken with a little grain of salt. Part of the reason that he was so successful in the U.S. was he was a great self-promoter and kind of dramatic speaker. But basically, he was working for Grayson's and he was flying back and forth across the country from New York to Los Angeles. And his flight got caught in the fog and he had to land in Detroit unexpectedly and he was like okay I'm in Detroit like I've got a few a time to kill let me go see JL Hudson's which was the grand 13 story department store in downtown Detroit and he went to see the department store and he was like well yes this is gorgeous but what's going on on the streets around it he has this very gloomy description of the streets being deserted and he's like well how can this store survive if nobody is going downtown anymore so he asked his host in Detroit to drive him around, like kind of where is the action in this place? And his host immediately drew, drove him out to the suburbs, particularly the northern suburbs that have always been some of the richest, nicest suburbs in Detroit, um, and said, yeah, this is where the action is. Like, look at all these beautiful neighborhoods and houses. But then Gruen was really disgusted by the shopping opportunities that were on offer up there because it was like a Sears in the middle of a parking lot, just a strip mall, and you'd have to like pull your car out of one little strip mall to go into the next one. And he thought there has to be a better way. So he went home and he came up with this plan to basically get the JL Hudson company to subsidize what eventually he proposed to be four malls at the cardinal points in the suburbs outside Detroit, Northland, Southland, Eastland, and Westland. And Northland and Eastland were the only two that were built, but you see like how big his vision was that he thought, you know, basically he could restructure Detroit with these four malls. And were Northland and Eastland the only ones built because those are the wealthier areas to the north, Gross, uh, Bloomfield Hills, and to the east, Gross Point? It, it, and, and is that a sort of an, an exemplar and an indicative of the way things were going, that malls were built where there was money? Or was that just a, some, for some other reason? Well, malls were definitely built where there was money, but I also just think like that was too long-term and grandiose a plan for um, Hudson's to underwrite. And, you know, it's like, it was a big plan. He, he maybe never expected them to do the whole thing. But after the success of Northland, like his career was basically made. Um, so he didn't need to, you know, do those other malls necessarily. Right. I mean, I think a lot of times you see that these companies, like they, you know, they pay for a master plan and then they execute a part of it. And if it's successful, they don't really feel like they have to go forward. So Northland is not the first mall, but it's, it's it, how do you describe it in mall yeah. history? Northland is technically a shopping center, not a mall, because mm -hmm. it's not all interior. Mm -hmm. um, and Northland has, um, you know, a branch of Hudson's as its anchor, and it has kind of bars of stores, but the outdoor spaces that knit the stores together are exterior. They have sculpture, actually some really quite wonderful sculpture. So that was a better version of a shopping center. You know, it wasn't a strip mall. It had internal landscaping and artworks and everything, but it still wasn't under a single roof. I see my friend Debbie has put up that the first mall she ever went to was Northland in Detroit, where her grandmother took her there on a bus. Now we hear stories all the time. I hear it in Hartford. My grandmother took me or my mother took me, my father took me to, to, to G Fox, which is the, the downtown and later of course became uh, now it's all rolled into Macy's. It's like Bank of America, but it, it, but but it was G Fox uh, and Company here in Hartford, nine stories downtown. The and and, and some of the, the the salespeople were wearing white gloves, and it was a big event. Did that big event feeling follow out to the malls, or were the malls the break to which we had a more informal shopping experience, or was there something in between? That big event feeling did follow the department stores out into the malls, but I think you have to think of the malls as a slightly kind of taken apart version of those department stores because the old department stores often had, you know, a fountain on the ground floor and a ladies lounge and all of these things. And the department store branches and the malls were somewhat smaller. So some of that kind of scenic 
and and like restaurants were dispersed into the body of the mall. Mm -hmm. But when these malls first opened, they were really treated as super exciting events like the opening of Northland and then subsequently the opening of Southdale got national and international press. And even their more recent mall openings that, you know, I found articles about where, you know, they talked about how on the opening day, there would be a fashion show, there would be like confetti, like the governor of the state would come to open them. Like these were seen as really kind of big urban moves that were gonna improve the lot of people, not just in the immediate vicinity, but of the whole area. So I do think there was that kind of festive civic spirit in the opening of the malls and in how people treated a trip to the mall. So let's go back for, I wanna talk about malls in, in, in the, the sort of the American mind as the new town square. And with that in mind, before we get to that, image and, and all the, the, the legalities around that and, and design and everything else. I want to get back to Victor Gruen, because you mentioned he came from Europe, he comes from Central Europe, right? And he lands in America and he sees the World's Fair and all that stuff. My father tells me stories about the World's Fair. And, and it, it's, it, it strikes me that Irving Berlin and Louis B. Mayer and other Hollywood giants were uh, Jews, who immigrated to this country to escape something, persecution in Europe, not something, and created an image of America in the, in the case of White Christmas, in, case, in the case of you know, some of the great uh, Hollywood movies uh, that then America takes on as being part of its own heart. And, and, and so in, in a sense, it's life imitating art, but is, it, is Victor Gruen a part of that panoply? Is he, there's this, I don't know that it happens, the examples I gave are Jewish, they don't have to be Jewish, but it was the creation of something distinctly American by someone who is a recent immigrant that then gets taken as the heart of America. Yeah, no, I think he definitely fits in that panoply. And I actually think, you know, what he was trying to do was very similar to what film directors try to do, right? Because he is setting a scene. He is predicting human behavior. He's trying to kind of tell people how to act through the architecture. And I think, I think the immigrant experience is relevant because it's like sometimes you have to be outside a place to identify what a place is missing. Right, you just have like a little bit of a through the looking glass or through the shop window perspective, and I think that's what Gruen had. Like he knew what he had grew, grown up with. He knew that you know post war America didn't look like that. But how could he bring those two ideas together? And I think that somebody who hadn't grown up in Europe wouldn't have like had the desire to put those two ideas together or thought that that was a good idea. Right, right, right. So if Alexis de Tocqueville had had designed malls, what would they have looked like? I guess we'll have to always wonder that. But let's get to the question of the town square. Uh, from the outset, the mall follows the move to the suburbs uh, and, and, and Hartford had a, a significant piece of that. And talk about that in 1957, I believe, there was a meeting at a famous place right near where I'm sitting, about a mile and a half away. Yeah, there was a famous meeting of kind of CEOs, urbanists, developers, um, kind of the leaders of American society at that time at Connecticut General in Bloomfield, Connecticut. And they came together basically to try to solve the problem of downtowns. Like at that point in the late 50s, people could already see that industry as well as shopping were moving out of center cities and they had a question and they were sort of trying to talk to each other and like get together and collaborate about what could be done about that. Um, you know, from early on, downtown leaders saw that malls were going to siphon off business, but at a certain point, I think they felt kind of helpless. Like our people are moving to the suburbs and they don't want to come back into the city. So either we can try to, I don't know, kind of dragoon them to keep coming downtown, or we can build a gorgeous suburban campus like it's. Connecticut General and kind of give them more amenities in that campus. So those corporate campuses and shopping malls are very similar in concept and were responding to similar changes in geography and cities. Mark Twain would love the irony that a bunch of people got together, men got together, 
to, to, to help save downtowns. And they did more in Hartford anyway to screw the downtown of Hartford that is to this day trying to recover uh, than, than any other force, including a number of things that we're not getting into here. But out of that, did malls come or was that, what was the relationship between that and the development of malls, that thinking? I mean, malls were, malls were developing already independently, but it, but both that conference and the development of suburban campuses, they all come out of the same post-war patterns. And those patterns are really set by the federal government when it decided to subsidize the building of highways and the building of residential suburbs. So the government basically said to people, here, we'll give you this beautiful wide road and we'll give you a subsidized mortgage to buy a new single family home outside the city. And I feel that they didn't really think it through. Like they didn't think, A, they didn't think through what was gonna happen to the city once everyone was living farther away from it, um, especially families. And I also think they didn't think through like what were the women and children gonna do all day while the husbands were at work on the corporate campuses in industrial parks or maybe back downtown if they were still commuting. And that's where I think the mall really comes in. I mean, some people see the mall as dystopian and destructive and, you know, I'll allow that, but I also think that suburbs would have been even more dystopian if we hadn't had the mall. Like imagine that people hadn't had anywhere to go. They were literally sort of stuck in their homes if they only had one car. I think that would have been, you know, kind of a much sadder existence and that the mall really became an important community space, especially for um, the women that were living in those suburbs. So to pick up on your thought about the way the government was subsidizing highways, the government was subsidizing mortgages, um, mm -hmm. and you get in the book into a lot of racial issues, which I'll ask you about in a minute. But first, the question of the town square. The government didn't envision a place for people to gather. Right. Uh, right. And, so, and so does the mall become that by design, or does the mall become that by accident? I think it becomes that by design because Gruen is pretty explicit, especially in like the early kind of first flush of mall innovation, that malls should have public facilities. Um, early malls often sometimes had churches or other kind of community rooms that people could rent out. Um, sometimes they had small branches of the town government. And Gruen always talked about it as a space for people to gather. Like he, like he did understand people and what they needed and wanted. So he never thought of it as a purely commercial enterprise. And in fact, just speaking of plans that didn't happen, the original, his original master plan for Southdale included medical facilities, office building, like basically Southdale as a town center for a new. Um, you know, kind of building up Edina as like a secondary city outside downtown Minneapolis. And again, like the Dayton family who um, subsidized the plans for that mall decided that they didn't want to get into building all that other stuff and sold off the extra land that they had and other developers just built fairly typical kind of cul-de-sac type suburbs. So this is a utopian vision of malls that takes early and I should uh, we should tell folks here that we're talking about the years here of uh, immediate post-war to about uh, 1958 or so those 10 years yeah 10 15 yeah. 10 or 15 years uh -huh. and so there's this utopian vision of malls that start to take root and they start to be built and they're always special and they're built with 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 great design flourishes right but are they great design? Or are they built with things that are designed to be flashy, like aviaries and, and stuff like that? Well, I think of the aviary as more like a, a brooch or something. You know, it's like an accessory. Um, are they great design? I don't think they rise to the level of great design, but I think they're extremely high quality modern design. Like I often um, compare the architecture of North Park by E.G. Hamilton or something like the early Gruen malls to Lincoln Center, this kind of very stripped down neoclassicism, simple lines, you know, kind of arcades outside. So it's not particularly detailed or luxurious, but the materials are high quality and the details are very well thought through. Mm -hmm. um, and some of the early developers I mentioned just kind of briefly, Edward J. Dubartolo, who was a major mall developer based in Ohio, like 
Ohio people know De Bartolo malls, he was like very obsessed with the maintenance of his malls. Like he understood that that was something that people often subconsciously respond to, you know, things being clean, things being neat, like all the plants being fresh and flowering. And so he really stressed high high end materials that could be easily cleaned. And then he would sort of tweak a basic design to suit the geographical reason that it was going to be built in. So a Di Bartolo mall in Florida and a Di Bartolo mall in Ohio ha would have a similar plan, but the details and the materials would be slightly different um, just because of the geographical difference. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And what is Ray Bradbury's role in all this? You mentioned there's an anecdote involving uh, the, the writer Ray Bradbury. Uh, yeah. I, yeah. I, if I remember correctly, it, was, it had to do with something he wrote that, was it Victor Gruen picked up? Actually, it was John Jerdy, who is a later. Jerdy, of course, Jerdy, right. Yeah, I mean, one of the fun things that happened as I went on doing the research for this book was I found all of these interesting characters famous for something else that had been really interested in malls. So I was like, oh, there's this whole kind of like intellectual literary history of people who loved malls. Um, and Ray Bradbury was one of those people. Um, Bradbury had moved to... Um, he moved to Los Angeles from the Midwest uh, when he was in his late teens. And he, he remembered a Los Angeles that was more like a series of small towns. But by the 1970s, Los Angeles had really started to sprawl and he felt like Los Angeles had lost those smaller centers. So he wrote a really beautiful essay called The Girls Go This Way, The Boys Go That Way, about a Mexican plaza and how what he really thought Los Angeles needed was a new form of the plaza. And this young architect who was working for a mall design firm named John Jurdy um, read that essay and wrote to Bradbury and said, hey, I have this new project that I'm supposed to build in downtown San Diego. Would you write something for my project? Basically, I mean, what he ended up writing is called, um, it's on, called On Lostness. And it kind of, it, it's kind of an essay. It's kind of a poem. It's kind of just like a mood piece. But Bradbury and Jerdy just stayed friends for years. And um, both of them were really affected by this idea that by the late 1970s, malls had become too boring, you know, as you referred to before, too yeah. standardized, and that they needed um, to inject like some new level of magic into them. And so one of the things that Dirty and, and Bradbury talked about is this idea of getting lost, that there should be this like third floor of the mall where there's an arcade and a magic store and some sort of used bookstore that they needed some eccentricity and they shouldn't go on being just kind of clean, well-lighted spaces. So the mall becomes not a place that you can, where you can, it is a place where you can buy stuff, but it's not just a place where you can buy stuff. And it's not just a distraction and a place for people to meet. It's a whole, it's, a, it's the central or a central force that shapes these places where it pops up. Is that overstating uh, the case that it's really a shaper of cities and towns? No, I don't think so. I mean, just as the department stores were major shapers of like early 20th century cities, I think the mall is a major shaper of um, you know, post-war and beyond cities. And there were a couple of developers that I talked about, Gerald Hines in Texas, and one of them who really bit, tried, you know, as Gruen originally had wanted to build a whole new city around a mall. So, you know, they came to be understood, like the role of shopping came to be understood as very important, at least kind of in the real estate and development community. I feel like it's never gotten enough respect from the architecture community. Like the commercial architects are often kind of looked down on by um, the critical establishment and the architectural establishment. But that was like one of the things that I, you know, made me want to write this book and I found exciting in doing the research is just this idea that like, okay, shopping, like we're kind of dismissive of it, you know, maybe we, you know, sometimes like hide the receipts or whatever, but actually it's a very powerful force. It's something that humans have always done and it's always been um, a collective thing, you know, a, a communitarian thing, a social thing. And if we ignore that, we really let ourselves in for a very like boring, disjointed, disconnected life. So the mall can be a place of integration and it can be a racially integrating force in society if, if organized correctly. 
or right. it can be a desegregating force in society. Which yeah. one has it ultimately been, or is it a little, obviously it's, it's, it's not all one way or another, but in yeah. your view, and you talk about race in the book and Thurgood Marshall, has the mall been a good force for, for racial integration in America? Not really. I mean, I, like, I don't think it's done everything that it could. And certainly the initial run of malls was um, a segregating force because the mall was built for people who um, were responding to messages, well, who were part of white flight, were living in neighborhoods that had covenants that didn't allow people of color to buy houses there. So the mall in its initial days was definitely for white people, for white families living in the suburbs because you know black soldiers weren't allowed to get the same loans and you know the whole kind of um, discussion of redlining that I don't want to get into now. But so malls were initially a white space. As the suburbs have diversified, particularly over the past 20 years, malls have become more diverse, both um, in their ownership, in their offerings, in who is shopping there. So I think that ultimately, like they can be a force for desegregation, but you have to have kind of liberalizing forces from the changing demographics of the suburbs and also from the ownership of malls, not always trying to go after this kind of idealized white middle-class shopper. And what was Thurgood Marshall's role? So Thurgood Marshall is another one of these people that I was like, oh, did not expect him to turn up in my book on malls. But Thurgood Marshall wrote um, the majority opinion for one of the first Supreme Court decisions in 1968 in the Logan Valley Plaza case um, about on the question of whether or not malls were public places. Um, the case in question was about whether um, supermarket union workers were allowed to protest at on a, a mall property. And so that initial case, that first case was decided um, in favor of the protesters that the mall in fact was a public place or, and the really interesting part of the um, opinion that Marshall wrote is that he says in 1968, that malls have become the new main street. And if malls are gonna play that role, then they have to allow protest because you know, part of the you know, purpose of public protest, part of the purpose of free speech is so that people can hear you. And if we denied people the platform of the mall as this new central force um, in the country, then we were basically like denying free speech and free protest. Um, so that I think, was, is kind of a major statement for 1968. As the court became more conservative over the ensuing um, 15 years, they heard a number of other cases that were basically around the same question and started to curtail that freedom um, until finally the, the Pruneyard case in the early 1980s, um, the federal Supreme Court kicked it back to the states and said that basically states could decide for themselves whether they wanted to have malls be public spaces or private spaces. So now, now there are only a handful of states in which you can legally protest at the mall. <laughs> well, a protest is one thing, but what about access? Like we in the newspaper business, we have this cat and mouse game with malls where if we want to do, if, if I want to go talk to people about some public issue, let's say uh, gun control or EPA, the, the Supreme Court decision today on environmental protection or something like that. I go to the mall because that's where there are people. There right. are other places. I can go to the post road. And I, there's lots of places, but the mall is a nice, good place. And the malls don't like that. They don't want to be associated with us going. What is? Where does that stand both culturally and legally? Can you go to the mall and, and treat it like you're in the town square if you're a regular person or a news reporter? You, you, you can, you can't. You can't. I mean, it is private property. So the the questions around, you know, kind of protests at the mall are saying that like when they're decided in favor of the plaintiffs, they're saying that like it is private property, but in this case, it can be treated as public property. But ultimately the mall is private property. Um, and that's, you know, that's one of the ambiguities that I talk about that I do believe that the mall, you know, serves important public functions, but it is not actually a public space. And we would all be wise to kind of understand the limits of those public functions, like what you're giving up and then what you're getting. I mean, one of the things I talked about is how 
um, for older people, people with disabilities, the mall is often like the best place to get exercise and meet their friends because malls have clean bathrooms. They have, you know, automatic doors. They have elevators. Um, wow. Yeah, they're very flat, like they have smooth floors. Like, and, and if you think about your city, it's like there are a lot of sidewalks that are not smooth, that are not barrier free. So they are offering things that cities by and large are not. And that is a problem. Like, I don't think it should be like that, but they are offering these things. And so, yes, they, like they serve an important role. They're providing things that the public realm cannot, but you are also giving up some freedoms when you go into a mall. Like nobody ever reads the mall code of conduct, but some of them are pretty draconian, particularly for teenagers. There's a mall code of conduct? Is There's it a mall code of conduct. If you Google your mall and code of conduct, something will probably pop up and, you know, it's interesting reading. Can't be good. You can't leave your two, two year old to run around unsupervised. That's, That's like right out. So, <laughs> right. So uh, I want to talk a little a, a bit about the rise and fall and rise and fall and rise and fall of malls. Um, first, in a word, how are malls today? There's 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 word I hear malls are dead. Is that true or how are malls today? I think malls are mixed. <laughs> Nobody are likes mixed. that answer. Malls are mixed. Um, there is a great mall die off that was already happening um, partially like since the last recession. Um, it has been exacerbated by the pandemic, but the patterns haven't really changed. It probably just accelerated the demise of some malls. Um, but even with the mall die off that's happening, there are still a lot of highly successful malls. There are still new malls being built and there's still seven to 800 you know, healthy or healthy-ish malls in the US, which to me seems like a hell of a lot. Like how can you say something is dead when there are still hundreds of them? Well, um, with, if there were thousands and there are hundreds, then yes. it's so I think I think the mall like the mall is in a transition period, but I don't think it's going to go away. And all of the kind of retail mall experts say that the U.S. was over mauled. So in some ways, this is a right sizing of the number of malls that we should really have and that like as a consumer base, we can support. So I'm reminded of an essay in which uh, the writer said that baseball is dead, that baseball no longer captures the imagination of American youth and baseball has been diluted with a set of new rules that take away the purism of baseball and that baseball is not gonna be the sport of the future. And that essay was written in 1856, right? Before the invention of the oldest league now, which is the National League, the start, which was by the way in Hartford, Connecticut. And is the same, can the same be said about malls that, that we, we hear about the death of malls, but that it, it is, is it destined to cycle back and back and back? Or is there a longer term because of the internet and because of the way people shop and because of the revival of downtowns and because of uh, um, the big box stores that we're looking at a, like a, a slow, what are we looking at in terms of the repeating of this theme of, of, of malls rising and falling? I mean, I think, like I said before, like I think we're at a point where we're kind of right sizing the number of malls, but I also think malls are ripe for another cycle of reinvention. Um, and I think that like, so there are, you know, historic so sort of the, the high end malls, like the luxury malls um, are still doing well. And I think they will continue on as kind of as they were. But I think there's going to be a lot of innovation in even malls that are doing relatively well that aren't quite so fancy because the internet is taking a chunk out of shopping and people got even more used to internet shopping um, during the pandemic. But I also think that there are new reasons that people like to leave the house that malls could and will incorporate. Um, like in the book, I talk a lot about food because I think, you know, people love to talk about food. People love marketplaces, like a kind of souped up food court, maybe one that also sells, um, you know, pre-made food that you could take home is something that people will go out for. And that is what some malls are putting in to replace their anchor stores. Um, North Park, mall in Dallas, which I mentioned in the book, just put in like a huge branch of Italy 
the you know Italian kind of gourmet market restaurant everything I don't know cooking classes so not every market can support an Italy like it Italy is pretty high end but something like that I think can work in a lot of other places I mean some places will just put in a Whole Foods because Whole Foods is kind of a destination grocery store and people are more willing to drive out of their way to a destination grocery store than they are to a destination department store these days. Now, what a, I see Jacques has put up, thank you, Jacques, a, a, a point about entertainment options. You talk about, in addition to food, you talk a little bit, a lot, about entertainment. Yeah. Is that the, the new wave or is that, is that generally in cities? Where do you see that fitting into the evolution of malls? I mean, I think, like, so John Jurdy, who I mentioned before, is the architect of the Mall of America. And he was the one who was like, let's put a roller coaster in the center of our mall. And I think that was a really important insight of how to kind of like soup up excitement around shopping. I don't think a lot of malls today are going to put in a roller coaster, but I think they're going to put in other kinds of family friendly entertainment. I mean, movie theaters are kind of a classic thing to have at the mall, but I've seen um, like VR places. Uh, so your kid can go in and put on the glasses and bumble around. Um, go-kart tracks, trampoline parks, gymnastic studios, like kind of family-friendly oh, climbing walls, like family-friendly physical things that you can't do at home, that you can't do on the internet are also, I think, a big market and can go into some of those very large spaces in malls. So it's, yeah, it's like things you can't do at home. Um, and also, uh, you know, I think just the, the family market in general, um, which was always important to malls, but it's like the structure of families and what families like to do to with each other has changed a bit. So, so that's a that's not just a, a fad or a trend. It's 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 the way things are going. What about housing? Uh, the mo the mall in Milford is trying to put in housing here in Connecticut. Uh, it, what about that? Well. Sometimes when you say like housing at the mall, people think, oh, we're going to convert the mall itself into housing. And I don't think that's a very good idea. Like it's very expensive and malls are really not structurally set up for housing. However, malls tend to have these giant parking lots that are very disconnected from the network of the city around them. And I think building new housing on those parking lots is going to be a really important thing, especially for cities that are trying to densify. Um, actually, Northland in Detroit, which I mentioned before, they it was sold in late uh, 2020, and the new owners are taking the core of it back to its 1954 mallness, and they're building all kinds of housing like around the outer edge of the parking lot. And mm -hmm. I think that is a really smart strategy. Oh, they're putting a food hall in the former Hudson store. So like they're doing all the things that I'm talking about. Um, and they may also be putting in some co-working spaces because even if people aren't going back to like the big office three days a week, a lot of people still wanna work outside their home, especially if their home isn't that big. So let's go to a couple of questions. I see uh, Patty, a participant, asked the question, uh, and this is this gets into an area that I was going to ask you about uh, myself. Um, have you been to the Industry City buildings in Sunset Park, New York City? Would you would you consider that a kind of mall, or is it something else? And you may want to talk about some other developments in New York uh, as well, including uh, Hudson Yard uh, at, at, at the same time. So that's a good question. That is a great question. I have been to Industry City. I actually gave a version of this book talk at Industry City in May. Um, I think Industry City is great. Uh, Industry City is mall adjacent. I would say it's much closer to um, a kind of 1970s mall development called Festival Marketplaces. And the notable ones um, were Faneuil Hall and South Street Seaport and Harbor Place in Baltimore. And that was a way of, using old buildings, adaptive reuse of old buildings in cities to try to bring some of the people who had been going to the mall back into the city. Because if you've been to Industry City, you know, it doesn't feel like a mall. It's more quote unquote authentic. Um, there's a lot of local businesses. You know, there's a great like Japanese supermarket where I always buy snacks. Um, so that was really an idea that the developer James Rouse and the architects Ben and Jane Thompson came up with in the mid 1970s that was very successful. And I think Industry City is just the new version of that model. Um, and there are a couple of other places that are doing something similar in 
Houston, there's a place called Post, P-O-S-T, in a former post office that is kind of a similar setup to Industry City, this very stripped down concrete architecture. And then they brought in, you know, food bus businesses and other fun things. And they have a central area that you can sit in. I want to combine a question I have, which is a quote from your book, my favorite quote from the book, with a question from Deborah. jumping right ahead here, the last question. Uh, her question is, how is a festival mall different from a generic mall? And you answered that a little bit in that last response. But I want to read the quote that I have here, which you it's in, it's in your voice, not a quote from someone else in the book. In the rush to dance on the mall's grave, we risk treating the mall as only a disposable consumer object and neglecting the basic human need that it answered. Um, and that speaks to evolution uh, as well as the, the original role of the malls. Um, I'm not sure what the question is in all that, but if you, if you pair the festival mall concept with that quote, uh, I wanna have you comment on that. Okay, yeah, the festival mall, I think she's probably talking about the festival marketplace and I think I answered that part. Yes. But I mean, the human need that I'm talking about is the fact that people like to be with people. They like to look at people, they like to walk around with people, they like to shop with people, but they're like, we have a need to socialize and we need comfortable spaces to do that in that are also convenient. Um, we can get a snack, we can do an errand, you know, that combine a lot of different activities in one space. Um, and I think, I think that, it was important to me in this book to show like all the different ways that like things can be a mall that you know if we just think of them as only those like blank boxes on the highway we're not understanding the thread that connects all of them and in the 1970s um which is really when the concept of adaptive reuse was invented mm -hmm. you know a lot of these old brick buildings that we now see see as very beautiful and valuable were just going to be torn down and thrown away so it was you know, kind of visionary to reuse them and now industry city is a good example of this it's easy enough to see okay industry city like has some beauty and value but i think we also have to apply that mindset to some of these dead malls like i think they too um some of them are beautiful, some of them are not, but at the very least, like we're at an all time high for the cost of materials like concrete and steel, and we should reuse that architecture. And in fact, malls like those earlier factory buildings can be put to new uses. And it's kind of incumbent on us for environmental reasons to do that, but also not to kind of throw away the relationship that people already have with these places. Um, like everybody knows where say the South Square in their town is. There's already this name recognition. Um, there are memories that people have of the place. And so how can you build on that name recognition and those memories and reuse the buildings? I see uh, from our friend, Diane Smith. And yes, Diane, I did go to the World's Fair in 1964. Uh, and I remember riding the, the car that you could go up and down and around in. I don't remember much about retail there. But her question here is, uh, what is the cultural significance of the Mall of America and what has happened to it lately? And I would say uh, with, with, with a question, a, a note to that question about whether it was too damn big. Oh, I mean, the Mall of America was like, basically I identify kind of three major mall innovators and the first was Victor Grew and the second was James Rouse, who I mentioned who created Faneuil Hall. And the third was John Jurdy, who was the architect of the Mall of America. Cause John Jurdy is really the one who saw that entertainment could be this draw and could be combined with shopping. So I think the Mall of America is a really important kind of postmodern masterpiece kind of building on America's like love of shopping, car culture, Disney, and putting it all under one roof. So I think it's really significant both architecturally and culturally. I think that it's been diminished over time. I mean, like pictures that I've seen of more recently renovated parts of it are much more generic than it initially was. And I also think when it was built, people didn't travel as much nationally and internationally. So part of the draw was that you could basically go to Disneyland, go to New Orleans and go to Europe, like all in one place. And that that, because those places were still exotic and well, it's a little bit different now, but more people, you know, 
feel more able to go to Europe now or to just fly across the country um, you know, when fares were lower. So I think the Mall of America was built in that way for a particular like cultural economic moment. And it probably needs to find new footing in today's economic moment. Um, and I don't think making it into just kind of a generic luxury mall is the right way to go. Mm -hmm. Wait a minute, this is another Mark Twain moment here. Disneyland, which is designed to replicate the rest of the world, is itself being replicated at a mall for people for whom that becomes exotic. Okay. Yes. Um, I want to get to it. Modernism. I mean, yeah. You, you know that well that there's a lot in the book that yeah. about postmodern and postmodern thinking and postmodernism. And suffice it to say, I gather that all of these adaptive reuses are part of the whole postmodern ethic. Um, yeah. But is it a, is it just a, a hopeless melange architecturally, or are good things happening? At the Mall of America? No, broadly, oh. in oh. adaptive reuse. Oh, in adaptive reuse. No, I think interesting things are happening in adaptive reuse. I mean, I like personally um, kind of love the 70s adaptive reuse more because it tended to be warmer, more textural. Like a lot of today's adaptive reuse really um, has a very kind of minimalist materials palette. If you've been to um, Essex Market on the Lower East Side, which I generally like as a project, it's still, it's like very colorless. You know, it's like gray with black and white signage and, and a fancy roof. Um, and that's nice, but I kind of get more of a festival feeling from the pictures I see of Mall of America or of Faneuil Hall in the 70s, where they had colorful banners and they had jugglers and they had carts. And it was trying a li little bit more to be like a marketplace um, in Central or South America or a marketplace in Europe. I want to get to a good question here from uh, Joe, uh, Joe Wynn. Malls are the safest and most interesting pedestrian places in most suburbs. Uh, do you I, see them as a tool to encourage bringing its upsides out to create more walkable communities? Obviously, we're all talking about walkable communities, yeah, yeah. Uh, in, including shopping and, and the whole panoply in, in greater society. Yes. I mean, yeah, I would say yes to all of that. Um, there's a great book that I read by um, June Williamson and Ellen Dun Dunham Jones called Retrofitting Suburbia, and they talk about some specific case studies where along with the pedestrian amenities inside a mall, um, different uh, you know, civic entities have basically like put the roads back through the mall parking lots and built sidewalks, built bike lanes, added trees, so that the mall starts to become um, integrated into the fabric of the residential neighborhoods around it, rather than being this kind of separated island. And yeah, I think that's really important. Um, I was talking to a friend of mine, you know, earlier in the pandemic, and she said, "Oh, my parents used to, you know, walk in their mall every morning. And when the mall shut down because of the pandemic, they actually walked in the mall parking lot instead." And I was like, "What are you talking about? Like that seems that sounds so wrong." And they were like, "Well, the parking lot was empty, and in fact, in their town, there are no sidewalks. So again, the mall parking lot was the smoothest, largest surface area in their suburban town." for them to walk in. And that is just like a terrible statement about the state of pedestrian infrastructure and how I think the US makes it so hard for people just to get exercises out their front door. Like we'd all be healthier if we lived in pedestrian places. So yeah, I think if the, if the mall's pedestrianism could spill outwards and not just be contained inwards, that would be great for a lot of places. Having grown up in the next town over from Paramus, New Jersey, capital of the Northeast malls, uh, I can say we did use those parking lots as a place to learn how to drive uh, when yes, we were 16. I and definitely 17. did that in North Carolina. Now, yeah. I do. I want to talk a little bit about one. We're coming to the end here, but about one surprising bit of technology that makes sense if you think about it. Going back to the beginning of malls, there's all this big picture thought about America and where it's going and out to the suburbs, but it ain't happening if there isn't large scale air conditioning that comes in after the war, after World War II. Talk a little bit of, for a minute, just a, a few seconds about that. Sure. 
Yeah, I mean, I think that's another funny thing. It's like, do we think about shopping and technology? I mean, now we do with internet shopping, but not necessarily so much with earlier shopping. But climate control, sort of both heating and cooling, were really important to the success of the mall. When Gruen was pitching and then they were advertising Southdale, the big slogan was 365 shopping days a year. Because in Minnesota, like you don't go outside and shop in the winter. And I'm told it's incredibly humid in the summer. And so there were really only two seasons in which people wanted to shop outside in downtown. But now with the air conditioned shopping mall, at any time, the shopping mall would be um, clement. And in fact, the, the central space at Southdale was called the garden court of perpetual spring. You know, at the mall, it was always springtime. And, you know, if you were building a mall in Texas, you were like, okay, it's always going to be, you know, temperate here. And with air conditioning, if you were building a mall up north, then you were saying, okay, it's going to be heated in the winter and no snow. You're like, nobody needs to shovel. So yeah, air conditioning, climate control were hugely important um, in making it a place that people wanted to be. So we're winding up. I, I know that you are generally pro-mall, but not, not fawning of malls, but generally pro-mall. Um, I want to say first that I think it's great. I, in some ways, I wish we were in person, of course, but in some ways, this is adaptive reuse of technology. Um, hi, Jody, because I'm seeing references to malls and I'm reading them and I think you're reading them, we're all reading them and it's great to see them. I don't know if they amount to questions, but it's great to see them. Let me just finish with one question. Is that all right, Jody? Yeah. And the question is, if, if, if we can imagine a counterfactual world, was it automatic that we were gonna end up with these 2000 or whatever the number of is, large scale, million square foot, 500,000 to 2 million square foot shopping things, malls that we call malls, Right? Or was there a potential counterfactual coming out of World War II, coming out of the World's Fair of 1938, where that wasn't going to happen, where it was all micro retail, where there was something else that happened? Was this inevitable? I mean, I don't think so. Like, I think you can see kind of the light bulb go on, you know. There might, if Victor Gruen hadn't existed, somebody else might have come up with it. But I do think, like, just a few people came up with this idea and, like, had the chutzpah to propose it and kind of get these deals done. So, yeah, I think we could have ended up with a much more atomized version of the suburbs that, frankly, to me, seems incredibly bleak. Interesting. That's a great place to finish. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Thank you both so much. This has been such a great discussion and I'm really sad to have to pop on and like end it because I know we have unanswered questions and the chat's been super active tonight. So I want to thank you both again for, for coming on and doing this. And Alexandra, thank you for writing this book and agreeing to come on and chat about it. Um, if you haven't done it already, find the link in the chat and it'll be popped in just a moment. Um, buy the book, it's signed, it's really funny, it's really great, has great illustrations. Um, and uh, just a reminder to everybody, if uh, you enjoyed this and you want to rewatch it, or you have a friend who you think would want to rewatch it, um, it'll be up on our YouTube page in just a couple of days. So um, thank you, everybody, and uh, good night. Yeah. Well, thank you. Hey. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Thanks so much for hosting me. And thanks, everybody for tuning in. Um, I can see how lively the chat is. And like, that makes me happy. It's like everybody should be sharing their mall memories. So great. Thank you, Alexandra. Sure. Thanks. Okay. Bye. <laughs>